Nobody ever calls me Dr. Cole. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, and again, uh, John and Sarah, thank you so much uh, for this invitation. It's my first time in Texas. Um, it's really a joy being at a multidisciplinary uh, conference like this. Um, so I hope I have some useful perspectives for Lubbock. Like Sarah was just saying, Tucson went dry a while ago, like really dry a while ago. And we pour, import all of our water from the Colorado River outside of whatever rainwater we get. Um, so what I'll be walking you all through is the history of uh, the history of Tucson. The timelines are quite similar to what we've discussed here in Lubbock. Um, and then what happened and what we're doing about it. So and it will conclude on some, some points around uh, education and what we think we may be able to do going forward. So a bit about Sonoran Institute. We are a conservation nonprofit. We're just over 30 years old. And our mission here, as it says, is to connect people and communities with the natural resources that nourish and sustain them. When we were first founded, we worked a lot with development at the gateway communities by national parks, because there was a huge push of development right around national parks, which was threatening to upend what national parks were all about. So the, the concept was really to have the right development, the right water use at the right place. Uh, over our time, we've uh, effectively moved around $30 million of investment. We do not have $30 million, just in case that's where you're going with. That's sort of our collective, what we've been able to do. Uh, and all in all, throughout the, throughout the American West and down in northern Baja California, and a little bit in Canada, we've conserved, uh, our conservation efforts have protected um, half a million acres. So here's just, here's where we are at with the Colorado River watershed and where Sonoran Institute's programming works. So we're considering the Colorado River Basin for the most part as the West, fairly or unfairly. In this watershed, there are 40 million people, 5.5 million acres of farmland. We have a tri-national watershed. There are lots of established self-governing Native nations, 21 high biodiversity areas, and a $1.4 trillion economy. Sonoran Institutes has three programs where we envision the Colorado River Basin, where rivers are flowing and landscapes are healthy and all communities thrive. Everything we've been talking about in this conference so far. Uh, our three programs, we have the Colorado River Delta program down here on the bottom left. This is a program that works to rehabilitate the delta that the Colorado River used to drain into. It used to connect here with the Gulf of California, Sea of Cortez. Uh, it no longer does all the time. Um, but because of water governance, Mexico has a significant chunk of water that's held behind Lake Mead. We work on doing international cross-border policy to store that water behind Lake Mead so that when it's time and we want to try to connect the river, to the sea like we did last year, we get six or so months of water release from behind Lake Mead. That's gonna be happening again in 2022. So that's like tree planting, dredging, things like that. Santa Cruz River program, that's my program that I'll be talking about. Uh, it's, it's very place-based um, down and around Tucson and in Northern Sonora. And then we have another program called Growing Water Smart. This is kind of reaches back to what I was talking about, the original concept of Sonoran Institute, where we work with municipalities. At this point, we've worked with half of the population or representation that represents half of the population of Colorado and a large chunk of Arizona, where elected officials, municipal partners from everywhere from development and economics to water management to hydrologists all come together to with a, with a singular problem that relates to that municipality, that county, where they work on identifying what the water problems are, coming up with solutions, and most importantly, coming up with messaging around that, because without good messaging, the whole thing falls apart. So those are the areas that we're currently doing Growing Water Smart, though we are working on bringing it to California. And I've circled the Ambos Megales down here. Uh, sister cities that are along the border that have shared water resources. So um, just like, oh man, I always forget it. El Paso and Juarez. Juarez is another one of the cities that we are 
uh, looking to bring this Growing Water Smart program to because it's just a border. It's, you know, the, the water resources are shared and can really work a lot more efficiently when those water resources are being done in concert with one another. That's all the other Sonoran Institute stuff. Let's talk about the Santa Cruz River program. This is my program. Um, it is a effluent dominated river. There are two stretches of this river that flow perennially. They're lush, they're beautiful, and we're using projects um, like we talked about earlier today where we are back channeling wastewater back upstream and releasing it to create flowing stretches of the Santa Cruz River. Our vision here is from Mexico to Marana, which is the town just north of Tucson, um, a living, flowing Santa Cruz River that's the foundation of community health and prosperity. So here is a little bit of a zoom in on the Santa Cruz River watershed. It's the only river that crosses the US-Mexico border twice. It's a tri-national river, which I'll get to in a second. So up here, we have the San Rafael Valley. It's sort of an upside down horseshoe. So that feeds some perennial flows here at the headwaters. It goes then south here by San Lazaro, and it comes up north here by Nogales. And these dashed lines are where the river could flow. It typically doesn't. Then we have a stretch of river here. This is about 16 miles that comes out of this Nogales International Wastewater Treatment Plant. This treatment plant gets the majority of its wastewater from Nogales, Sonora, that is pumped through a pumping station and a pipeline to the US where it's treated and it becomes the Santa Cruz River. There's just not the infrastructure in, in Nogales, Sonora to handle the wastewater. So 15, 16 miles of river here and then it goes dry all the way up here until you get to about Tucson. This is a geologically, historically dry stretch of the river. There's a big groundwater, uh, there's a big bedrock drop right around this drop here that is very fast to recharge, very fast to drain. Right? Very similar, similar to what we've been talking about. Up here around Tucson, we have this small stretch of the river here. This was created in 2019, and I'll come back to that in a little bit more. And then we have these two wastewater treatment plants here north of Tucson, Agua Nueva and Tres Rios, and they create about 23, 24 miles of flow. And I'll talk a bit about the history of those going forward. And again, remember, all of this water that is creating the Santa Cruz River is coming from the Colorado River. It's pumped through aqueduct, pumped uphill, and it flows through aqueducts and canals into Tucson and into a lot of the other states in the Southwest that is the primary source of drinking water. Because we used up all the groundwater. Similar timetables, we have about 12,000 years of rich history here in the Santa Cruz. Um, we have a report that came out in 2017 called the State of the Santa Cruz River on our website. That's a really lovely report. Um, and this is not our land. Um, this was where, so over here we have the Sonoran Desert. Um, Tucson and the entirety of the Santa Cruz River, you can see it right here, uh, are within Autum land. The Tohono Autumn are the tribes, uh, is the tribe that has the largest land holding and, and historical land holding in this area. And just a little bit to the north of Tucson, there's another tribe called the Pascoyaki that have a, uh, that have a, a small reservation, a small nation there. For folks who follow Clean Water Act governance, the Pascoyaki were the ones who upended the recent clean water rule that took 90 plus percent of the water bodies in the Southwest and made them no longer protected under the Clean Water Act. So this very small nation was able to upend that entire act and get it thrown out outright. Good stuff. Tucson is where you have the saguaro cactus, the big old cowboy Looney Tunes cactus are everywhere. Um, and it's really endemic to this region. It absolutely struck me when I first moved out to Tucson a couple of years ago, just how massive and beautiful and everywhere these cactus are. And as you can see here, Tucson is just barely in the, you know, we talk about Tucson as being in the Southwest. It's in the Northeast of the Sonoran Desert. So depending on where your perspective is shifted, we're also, we could consider us being in the Northeast. Um, and not even all of the Santa Cruz River is within the Sonoran Desert. So don't 
don't give me any business about the name of the Sonoran Institute if we're not entirely in the Sonoran Desert. <laughs> so here's just a quick, a quick shot of, this is, um, uh, the name will come back to me in a second, in a second but this is a uh, national forest preserve in Tucson, just giving you an example of how ubiquitous these saguaro cactus are. They're, they're just so incredible. They're everywhere. They're massive. And they're really the, at the heart of a lot of the spiritual, tribal, communal nature of Tucson. So here we have, if anybody has ever had saguaro cactus fruit, it's sweet, uh, it's extremely hard to get, and it's fertilized by bats and big weird moths. Uh, but they're really, really lovely, and starting in just a few weeks, we start to get these big fried egg flowers on the crown along the top of the saguaro. I just wanted to put these in here because it, they still captivate me. And they captivated some of the earlier uh, you know, colonizers that came into Arizona. So this is a shot um, of Tucson from one of the many mountains that are in Tucson. Something I failed to mention is that Tucson is bounded to the west, north, and east by uh, different mountain chains. And they're referred to as the Sky Islands. They're an archipelago. They are a completely standalone uh, system where there are some large herbivores and birds that are endemic specific to these sky islands that don't exist anywhere else. This is a good take at a saguaro. Clearly somebody saw it and drew it after they got home. Um, but this gives you a sense of what Tucson would have look, looked like sort of in some early development. So this was in 1852, at least when this, when this painting was done. Um, and this is, from a, this is from a hill called Sentinel Peak or A Mountain. In Tucson, there's this one very central hill that has an A on the top of it because the University of Arizona is there. Um, and it's where Tucson gets its name from. Tucson was the autumn name for at the base of the Black Rock, which is where the Santa Cruz River flows. The Santa Cruz here would be flowing kind of right along this base of, the, of A Mountain, as we call it now. And a few other, so here's a very <laughs> probably unlikely image. Um, so this gives a sense of the mission and agrarian nature of, of Tucson. Um, here again, we have the same mountain chain up here to the north. This is Mission Garden. I was talking with somebody about Mission Garden. Yeah, so it's this beautiful uh, historic recreation of, um, and I don't even know if it was ever actually, ever actually there, but that's where it is now. And it attempts to recreate the 4,000 years of uninterrupted agriculture that's in Tucson. So other, I, I don't know if, if this is an arguable point, but um, we always say that it's the oldest agriculture in North America, oldest continuous agriculture in North America. Um, and attributing to that, we are, Tucson is the only North American UNESCO city of gastronomy. So we're recognized for our historical uh, influence on the gastronomic arts of North America. So um, again, the Santa Cruz River is going to be flowing right along here at the base. There were some other larger tributaries that used to flow when they flowed, but still in the desert. It would go dry for decades at a time, and geologically, it would go dry for centuries at a time. We're currently in the tail end of one of the wetter periods, and I'll talk a bit more about that. So just sort of orient yourself here. Um, see this little, the little mission just off center is to the left of the screen now. Again, taken from A Mountain. This is where everybody takes all their pictures. The uh, Santa Cruz River would have been flowing again right along the base. <coughs> we see now these agricultural plants are laid out. Lots of wheat uh, and lots of trees. Lots and lots of trees used to be in Tucson. The cottonwoods, um, some mesquite, and lots of willows the real, and hackberries. Very riparian city because it used to have this really shallow floodplain that when these monsoon storms would come through, the floodplain would really spread out. Really, really rich sediment would get deposited and make for good ag land. Again, here we're seeing the further conversion of, of ag land and 
urban land. And this is kind of the last, the last gasp, huge gasp, of a flowing Santa Cruz River. So this is around 1905. Um, you can see, again, the, the one to the left, that's at the base of A Mountain. So that's the Santa Cruz River flowing south to north. It would get these huge, huge flows, right? You see something of a little bit of a head cutting starting here. Um, some of the early developers tried to, thinking they were doing a good job by trying to bring some water into their land, did some, some head cutting, and it caused the entirety of the Santa Cruz River to get more and more and more incised. So it was no longer this flat floodplain, but it became much more of a ditch, a river ditch. But these are, these are what the Santa Cruz can look like, sort of. Um, have looked like in, in recent years when we've got some really big storms, but for the most part it is dry outside of the stretches that I'll be talking about. So 1950 and that was it. The river went dry and after a city, uh, after a century of really intensive ran ranching and agriculture, the, the system always existed on the margins. The river existed on the margins, I should say. And it was so close to already being tapped out just based on the the native uses that any sort of Anglo uses for ranching and agriculture and no shade on them. It just did it. It just sort of did the river in, especially when steam powered groundwater pumps came in, when people started irrigating <coughs> off river, it burned down a lot of the mesquite wood that used to, there was a huge mesquite bosque just on the south side of Tucson. So as soon as the steam powered pumps came online, that really advanced the overdraft of the, of the aquifer and it turned the Santa Cruz River into a falling or a losing stream. Whereas before the groundwater table was high enough that it was able to provide base flow that provided continual flow of the Santa Cruz. As the groundwater table fell, the river started net flowing into the groundwater rather than groundwater into the river. And this happens, and we've talked about this, and I apologize, I'm sure there's a lot of folks here who really know this in much higher detail. Up on the top here, we have a stream, the Santa Cruz River still has a, uh, still has a gaining system, but you can see this cone of depression around the well up on the top left. That's the pumping starts to, starts to pull, I mean, it's gravity. It starts to pull the water toward it as the groundwater level comes down. Eventually, after that cone of depression gets big enough, water just starts to waterfall toward that cone of depression, reversing the direction of flow. See, we no longer have flows going up into the stream. And then ultimately, the, the connection between the stream channel and the aquifer is severed. And that's where we see the Santa Cruz in most parts currently, and, and throughout a lot of the West. This is just another shot uh, showing that Mesquite Bosque prior to the uh, introduction of the steam-powered wells. And there's some efforts to try to recreate this um, Bosque, ideally, uh, and the southern part of Tucson because it's really not very well developed down there, fortunately, um, but there's also not a whole lot of water because mesquite will need some water until they can tap down deep. But it's a, it's a laudable idea. And here you can see this is really what the river looks like a lot of the time. It's sort of the dry riverbed, scrubs, forbs, and then where there are mesquite bosques, you can see them. And I think here you can kind of see some of that sharp inc incision Right, sort of along that stretch as well. So all that overdrafting in a lot of places too dropped the surface table as the aquifer kind of collapsed beneath by 20, 10, 20, 50 feet in some places. Very dramatic. So here's Tucson from A Mountain again. Um, this is probably five years ago. This is Mission Garden. Just getting up and running. So Mission Garden is only 10 years old. It's a really, really lovely place. Um, there's a new, and the Santa Cruz River is right down here. It's kind of hard to see. It's not, it's not flowing there, but the Santa Cruz is a down, down there along the bottom. This is a huge Superfund site. Uh, actually, I'm sorry. This is where the Santa Cruz is. This is a Superfund site. This is a Superfund site all through here. But somehow Mission Garden never got affected by Sorry, brownfield site. It's municipal. It's a municipal landfill. Um, 
So this has created some problems. As I'll get to in a little bit, I'll refer to the landfill in a little bit. This is the landfill that I'll be, that I'll be talking about in a bit. It's a beautiful city. I love Tucson. Um, and there's a lot of work that's happening around the river, which was part of the draw. But on top of, on top, you know, we're talking about the four problems around water, the four conditions around water. Sure, the river ran dry, and the city tried to do, and the county tried to do their best by putting wastewater, partially treated wastewater, into the river. And they did, and it was apparently gross. Just <laughs> stinky, stagnant, uh, no real fish existing in it. And it, 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 people avoided going to the river. And this is a generational issue. You know, a lot of people that I talk to either don't know the Santa Cruz River is there, or like, uh, I'm not going to the Santa Cruz River, it stinks. And it's just not the case anymore, but a lot of the work that I'm doing is trying to undo some of this uh, generational perception of what the Santa Cruz River is. So the program as I run it now really got going 2007, 2008 or so. So here we're looking in the southern stretch of the river, down around the Nogales International Wastewater Treatment Plant. You can follow the river path, right, going up here. And these are all dead cottonwood trees. All that gray you can see are dead cottonwood trees. The river is flowing there. And people say that it happened almost overnight. Just all these cottonwood trees died. And we took it to task to try to figure out what was happening along this stretch of the river. There's water right there, the feet away from the bases of these trees, but the trees seem to be uh, underhydrated and just dying out. What we learned was that the wastewater that was being put into the river that was flowing for 20 miles or so was so uh, nitrogen heavy, phosphorus heavy, carbon heavy, that it was creating a cap, uh, uh, an organic bacterial cap along the base of the river that was functioning like a slip and slide. The water was just going straight downstream and it wasn't percolating into the groundwater. So even though these trees were that close, they weren't able to get the water that they needed and they conked out. And it, it created a, an emergency in the community because there's a, there's a sizable community that lives along this stretch and they, were, they wanted answers and they wanted solutions. So, uh, Sonoran Institute got a, an EPA grant to start tracking the conditions in the Santa Cruz River, and we came up with this Living River Report. Um, we put this one out roughly every year, um, and we started putting them out in 2008, the 2008 water year, that was just before that Nogales wastewater treatment plant was upgraded. It used to just do um, secondary treatment, then they converted to tertiary treatment so there was far less nitrogen coming out of the system. So we're able to do a before and after. What's this, what are you getting out of this investment in your community? Which is what we use these Living River reports for. Um, and we have another one coming out this year. So that was lovely because very quickly we saw some significant recovery of the Santa Cruz River once they upgraded that wastewater treatment plant. That, that slip and slide layer started to break down, groundwater started to percolate in, people got a little bit confused and stressed out because the river wasn't flowing as far as it used to, but that's because now it's, go, it's, percolate, it's recharging the groundwater, whereas people were used to it going into their, you know, the folks who were at the margin of it, of the river, loved having it there, but it's not there anymore, but at least for a good reason. So here, like I said, 2008, major upgrade to that treatment plant. And this is a, this is a shot of the river just a couple of years ago. And the southern part of the Santa Cruz River is wild, big trees, big animals. It's really, really a lovely spot. Very like, very old world feeling over there. It's great. So then in 2013, 2012, we expanded the Living River Report to that northern stretch of the river, closer to Tucson in Pima County. Um, Pima County voters in like 2011 or so voted to bring on a $600 million bond initiative to upgrade those two wastewater treatment plants because we just saw 30 miles to the south what could happen when you do that. So the Pima County uh, 
connected with Sonoran Institute, and we started putting out these Living River reports just before they did the wastewater treatment plant upgrade, and now we've been doing them again every year since. Um, and the, the most recent one for the 2020 water year, I have some in the back by where the coffee is. Feel free to grab them. Um, and they're also, all of this is all available online as well. The goal here being, look, if, if your community is gonna say, we're gonna put $600 million of our tax dollars toward rehabilitating this river, like, you better be showing us what we're getting for our, for our money. And that's what we use these reports for. They are ultra readable. The idea is that they're great for classrooms. They're great for sending to your folks so they have some idea what you do for a job in Arizona. Um, they're great for putting in front of policymakers who can scan it in the four minutes that they're going to give whatever vote they're going to do to get a sense of what it is that they'd be voting on. This is, I think, just a reminder to let you know where the Santa Cruz River is. Yep. So here is what the northern part of the Santa Cruz River outfall looks like. This is kind of where the headwaters are just north of Tucson. This is at the Agua Nuevo wastewater treatment plant. Like I said, huge upgrades to tertiary treatment. So now a lot of that nitrogen has been removed, creating higher water quality. In the southwest, only 2% of the land area is any sort of riparian or water period habitat. Um, but over 80% of the species that live here have a portion of their life cycle in the river. So we really take that to heart and put a lot of work into collecting data sets and providing the means for universities, schools, citizen scientists to collect data so that we can understand what the conditions are in the river, what the trends are. Um, a few things I wanted to point out, it is a huge dragonfly and damselfly ecotourism spot. I don't know if it, there are any dragonfly heads in the room, but like people flock to Tucson to check out all the dragonflies and damselflies. Um, similarly, this is the Gila top minnow, which is, that's the best it's ever gonna look. It's the most nondescript, nothing minnow, um, but, they are, they're the canary in the coal mine. They were not in the river in the past, and if there is any nitrogen pollution in the river in the form of ammonia, they're gone. So the fact that we are now seeing the Gila top minnow in both the southern and the northern stretches of the river for the first time in like 100 years is really a good indication that these municipal decisions are doing something right, and we wanna like, we want to make sure that people know what those things are that they're doing uh, to reinforce that this was a good decision to spend some money on the environment because um, there are co-benefits that come to it. We're trying to recharge the groundwater. That's a big part of it. Remember, we're getting all this water from the Colorado River. Let's put some water in the, into the rivers where we can to recharge that groundwater and create a recreational amenity, and create more habitat for these native fish species that will attract birds, that will attract bugs, that will attract people. So I just wanted to give you a few shots. Again, this is a repeat shot there up on the top left um, of the, um, the upper Santa Cruz River. This is, you can probably can't see it, but that's the A of A Mountain. This is uh, the downtown stretch of the Santa Cruz River during a buffalo, buffalo grass pole. Buffalo grass is an in, uh, introduced, now invasive grass species that uh, cattle love for a few weeks and then it gets too tough to eat and it just proliferates. And it will set up around those saguaro cactus and it burns hot, 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 hot. So it's problematic because when we inevitably have fires, as we should, it really knocks out the saguaros whereas the more native grasses will burn flashy and quick, but they don't scar and kill the base of the, of the saguaro. So buffalo grass has really become a problem, uh, and there are lots of organizations that are working to try to eradicate it. I'm not sure if it's, if it's like a Sisyphean task or what, but there, folks, are, folks are really getting at it. And then this is just a really lovely picture of the Santa Cruz north of the city. Um, so this is looking, looking upstream. So when we're talking about volumes of water that create the flows, the 
the Nogales stretch of the river um, gets about 14 million gallons a day. And in this system, I don't know if it's typical, a million gallons a day gets you about a mile of flow. So we have about 14 miles of flow in the Nogales stretch. Um, and then up here in Tucson, we have closer to 23, 24 miles and a comparable million gallons per day. So it's a lot more population in Tucson and Pima County, which is what's resulting in this larger uh, amount of water that's released into the river. I didn't put a slide in here because I, I wanted to sort of lock in my presentation, but we were talking a lot yesterday and today about recharging, strategically recharging the groundwater. Um, Tucson has done a really fascinating thing for all of the investments that were made to bring water into the area from the Colorado River. When that water started to come in around 1990, Tucson made the decision early on that they were going to sock a third of that water. For every gallon, a third of it was just going to go underground and stay underground. And they, they did that partly out of panic because when we first got water from the Colorado River, we just put it right through the treatment plants and right to the tap, and it created a Flint, Michigan type problem. It's new chemistry water in pipes that have been around for 100 years, and it released all this gunk from the inside of the water treatment lines, and people were getting sick, orange water coming out, and the city scrambled to try to figure out what they did, what to do. So what they did was they took the water, they quickly used the wells that they had and sunk a lot of new wells to start putting all of that Colorado River water, when it's received, underground to both recharge the aquifer and to finish that water. So they're still using the groundwater wells that they used to use 50s, 60s, 70s, um, but they're using this now locally softened, conditioned water to then come up, be treated, and go through the, go through the treatment lines, which helped to fix the problem of really disgusting water coming out of the tap um, and had the co-benefit of helping to recharge the groundwater. So that's a third of the groundwater goes and stays underground. Tucson right now, accounting for climate change, accounting for continued development, has a 100-year wa assured water supply, which is just nobody else is doing that. Um, so it's a really, really smart municipal decision that accomplishes a lot on the side. Um, so that's all to say, you know, if this is what's if this is what's going into the river, a tiny this is a tiny portion of the overall water portfolio for Tucson. Similarly, um, we have in Pima County, which I was telling somebody earlier, it's like the size of Connecticut. Pima County has hundreds and hundreds of purple uh, purple pipes we call them, and they're reclaimed water. So we have this reclaimed water system that creates flows in Santa Cruz. That flows, stretches all throughout the county up into the, some of the ski resort areas where that water is used to water ball fields and where there are golf courses to water golf courses and other municipal uses um, so that we don't have to rely on this hundreds of miles piped in pristine Colorado River water to keep a dog park wet. You know, so um, it's, it's really a good, municipal action that this that the county has done in really expanding the water, water portfolio to make this reclaimed water available um, to those who need it and particularly for municipal uses. So, so the reclaimed water does that and goes into the Santa Cruz? That's correct. <laughs> yep. Um, as I was saying before, um, and just to get you oriented here, so we're looking at the ammonia concentrations before and before the wastewater treatment plants were upgraded and roughly current day. Over 10 milligrams per liter of ammonia in your system is cooked. Very, very few things can live in that. Some sunfish maybe, some like mosquitoes or uh, really tough worms can live in that. Um, and this is what was responsible for that sludge layer that kept the water from percolating into the groundwater. In the most recent years, we're getting practically no, you want to have some ammonia in your system. And around one to two milligrams per liter, that's good. And we're seeing under, the, and below that is also really fine as well. Um, so we're seeing a complete reversal of the water quality conditions that had been causing a lot of the problems in the Santa Cruz. And this is, this is what's allowing the Gila top minnow and a lot of the macroinvertebrates that we see in the river to start to come back. Speaking of, 
Um, again, we have before upgrade and let's say current. And so we had five or six different types of macroinvertebrates. So we had mosquitoes, we had these cryonid worms, if I'm saying that correctly. These things can live in a, the bottom of like a garbage can. Like, you know, they're, they can take anything. But now we're seeing the return of, like I was talking about dragonflies, damselflies, things that have a much more specific, much more refined need for better quality water. And we see year, year after year when we go out and we do our water, uh, our, our fish surveys and macroinvertebrate surveys, that we're getting, on average, more species for every effort that we go and a growing cumulative total of species over time. So before we had five species in the river observed at any one point, now we've seen 50 observed species. So it's an order of magnitude improvement of these macroinvertebrates, which are the food for the fish, which bring in the wildlife, you know, and the, and the system goes on from there. For the fish, I think maybe now you're oriented to how I'm doing these slides. Uh, like I said, every November we go out and we do a fish survey electroshocking and nets, we really, we really capture everything. Um, and prior to the upgrade, we did see the long fin dace in the Nogala stretch of the river, which is a really funky system. Um, there are some mountain pools that we think may have introduced some of the native fish species in, which is why we think we saw the, we saw the dace even back when the water quality was terrible. But what we typically see is the mosquito fish. These were introduced in the 50s and 60s to attempt to abate <coughs> A perceived mosquito problem and didn't do that and they <coughs> tend to outcompete a lot of the other fit native fish species. Now we're seeing a much larger increase in the presence of native fish. We have the, the Gila top minnow is now observed in both stretches and its habitat is expanding year after year. But we have some non, a lot of non-natives. The carp, we see lots of carp uh, and the black bullhead are in the river a fair amount. So I talked a little bit about flow extent. Uh, let me just go into that a little bit more. The red line here are, is the year that the sewage treatment plants were upgraded. Uh, looking at the Tucson stretch as an example, prior to the upgrades, the stretch, the river would flow uninterrupted for 23 miles. But as soon as those upgrades were made, not only did we see a shorter overall flow extent, but we started to see this break between the Agua Nueva wastewater treatment plant and the Trace Rios wastewater treatment plant. That's because we had that much more percolation happening into the river and it was creating this dry stretch where we had never seen one before. Further, you know, if you look at the Nogala stretch of the river, that's an even more pronounced change. Uh, after the treatment plant, the river extent kind of halved. Um, and ever since 2015, we've seen uh, a much steadier 14 or so miles of flow of the Santa Cruz down there. So that's been, that story has definitely been one that we've had to tell and tell and tell because it just doesn't, it doesn't hit you naturally that better quality water would mean less of a river flow, but here we are. Um, so one thing up around about the river in Tucson, excuse me, is that it's the narrowest part of the Santa Cruz River and it's also where the highest population density is. So the county has spent significant resources in putting in these big earthen banks to make a trapezoidal channel, kind of like we were talking about the LA River. It's like that, except it's not capped on the bottom, thank God. So we still have this much more pinched river, um, but it's for the purpose of flood control and public safety. Uh, out, after you get north of the river, this is, uh, after you get north of the city, this is maybe a mile north of that stretch there. We no longer have those earthen those earthen banks. Um, but it's a, really lovely, it's a really lovely spot for folks who are able to go. But it's extremely urbanized. I mean, it's very much right there where malls and shops and paths are. You have this river where it had either not been before or was there and smelled real bad. So then in 2019, a new stretch of the Santa Cruz River was created. This is called the Heritage Project. And again, it's right here at the base of um, A Mountain. And as I said before, that's where Tucson got its name, at the base of the Black Mountain. A Mountain is the Black Mountain. So on June 24, 2019, 
which is the Dia de San Juan, uh, which is the historical start of the monsoon season, to the city of Tucson, Tucson water, started to release that same water that flows in the river to the north. They pumped it back upstream and released it here just south of downtown. And within a year, I mean, with, within, within hours, the, this was full of dragonflies. And you never saw them there before because there was no water. So the dragonflies found this immediately. Then within a year, we had this really lush marsh system that had set up right there at that exact same outfall. And the community turned out for the heritage release. Um, it's a little bit hard to see, but there's a, there's a municip municipal trail up here. It's called the, the Huckleberry Loop. Um, it got rated the number one best recreational trail in the country last year by USA Today. I don't know what that's worth, but um, you know, it's a, it's, it's, a, it's a nationally recognized trail, and it's hundreds of miles, and it runs along both the Santa Cruz in Pima County and its larger tributaries. It's, ama it's a really, it's an amazing um, way to bring people safely to the river. So there was a you know, mariachi bands and all sorts of speakers, and all these folks showed up. It was like 113 degrees this day. Wicked. Um, but there's this like stream of pilgrimage of people going all the way down to where that outfall is, and it, uh, similarly, similar numbers up here along the top as well. The community is getting it, and it's really, really exciting. And the community couldn't get it if the amenities weren't there uh, and the resources weren't there to tell them about what's happening here in the river. Again, here we have the, this is the Heritage River, of the, the Heritage Reach of the river looking northward, so looking downstream. You have a mountain there on the left again. And you can see these, uh, these this is absolutely, this part here is the absolute most narrow part of the Santa Cruz. So this is a year and a half after water was first released, and you can see lots of vegetation setting up. The county had to do some significant dredging of this stretch because they hadn't done it since the 60s, and all of the sediment had accumulated, and it was becoming a flood risk. So they had to really plane the system down a couple of feet to accommodate additional flows of river. But they left behind, fortunately, this habitat so that the species that had set up there in the meantime had a refuge uh, while they were doing that earth moving. Again, here's a mountain at the top. You can kind of see it laying flat. This is at the very toe of the extent of the, of the heritage reach. So you can see this is narrow. This is super, super narrow. Um, but people use it. Look at all these footprints. People are down in the river all the time. People ride their horses in the river. It's a really, really uh, very cool amenity to have in a place where it had not been before. And as I mentioned, dragonflies really found those new flows quickly. Um, so on the y-axis here, you have the number of average dragonfly species observed at a given count. Here's when the water was introduced. There were five species seen, like I said, that afternoon. Um, dragonflies naturally decline in winter. So here we have the, a reference site up in Marana. This is a long-standing stretch of the river that's been flowing and clean. So, Let's call this natural, and this is brand new introduced. And for that being within a year and a half, it's really following a lot of the natural trends and at magnitudes comparable to what the natural system, or the natural system to the north, the reference system had been doing. Then in October 2020, the Gila Tottenau was released into the heritage stretch of the river. We had observed it to the north in those existing flowing stretches. We observed it to the south in the Nogala stretches of the river, but it had not yet made its way into this kind of isolated stretch here in the middle. So the mayor showed up, the media showed up, a lot of folks came out in the middle of COVID um, for the release of the Gila Top Minnow in the heritage reach of the river. Again, they just look like a drawing of fish. <laughs> They're just brown <laughs> fish. <laughs> But then, just two weeks ago, the long fin dace were reintroduced, both in the Heritage Reach, that same part of the river I was just talking about, and a little bit farther north at the Roger Road site that I have written out here. That's the stretch of the river a little bit to the north. 
This is guaranteed going to be pixely. Uh, hopefully not too much, but what you're going to see is the, the long fin dace getting um, released. This isn't, not, this isn't us attempting to put more water into the river, as my friends have attacked me for saying. <laughs> Let's see if we can catch them. There's going to be a big crew that flows down here to the south. Uh, there we go. There's going to be more to come. There we go. Now we're talking fly fishing. Yeah, right? Yeah, right. Let's see. It's going to be a matter of time before we can get something sizable enough. I mean, this is typically about as deep as the river gets. There aren't There's a Gila trout, right? What's that? Isn't there a Gila trout? That's, yeah. But not, they haven't been in the river forever. So we're going to have to do a lot more work to make <laughs> significant habitat. So what, what more is needed? How am I doing on time? Good. What more is needed? We are always working to secure more water for the river. There's more water to be had. We have a very leaky system. We have additional people moving into the Santa Cruz watershed. People make wastewater, and we've shown that that wastewater can be used for, um, for ecological purposes and for groundwater recharge purposes. Further, we're looking for opportunities to maximize flow. I'm running a big trash project, a big trash study right now to understand what types of trash are in the river, um, and I'll talk about that a little bit more. And again, seeking diverse opportunities to connect people to the river. So. Right now, the water that's in the river, right, it's effluent. That can be used for other purposes. They could decide at any one point, you know what? We're not, that we're getting less and less water from the Colorado River. We can't just put this stuff in the river. Sorry, we like it, but we can't. People need to drink water. They can take that water portfolio and change it up. Except, remember I was talking about that one stretch a little while ago that went dry between the two wastewater treatment plants. Our annual fish survey found in 2019 and 2020 that in that dry stretch there was uh, significant populations of the Gila top minnow. So what Pima County and the city of Tucson did was they applied for water. They applied for available effluent to be allocated to that stretch of the river at that two mile stretch that goes dry in June to ensure that it never goes dry. So now there is a permanent allocation of water at a minimum of 5 million gallons a day for those two miles, so we know that's going to cover it, um, to provide for habitat for the Gila top minnow. This was a pool of effluent. They have 10,000 acre feet available every year. It's created by a Pima County City of Tucson program, inter intergovernmental agreement. The only entities that can apply for that water are Pima County and the City of Tucson. It's been around for 20 years. <laughs> And they've never awarded it to themselves until this allocation was awarded because they proved that it was going to be used for uh, specific habitat purposes. So now, the, now the, the, the box has been cracked, and we think we have a, a path forward to create more flows permanently into the Santa Cruz because this used a very small amount of those 10,000 acre feet. Like I said, I'm doing a project right now to assess trash in the Santa Cruz River. It's a threat. It's a big threat to habitat, and it could really set back a lot of the work that we've done. To the south here, in the Nogala stretch of the river, there's a 16-acre trash dam that has caused the Santa Cruz River to jump its banks to a historic um, flow reach of the river, uh, which happens from time. It happens geologically. It doesn't and shouldn't happen because there's tons of trash in the river that causes it to buck its channel and flow to another stretch. Um, and then similarly here in Tucson, it's a really big problem because I guess like here, we don't have much of a storm water system. Everything is overland. So when it rains, when we get our big monsoon storms, there's just a big bucket of water being dumped in the city. Everything gets shunted into the river. So my work right now is to try to identify what the drivers are and what the quality of trash is so we can start coming up with some solutions. So we had a huge trash project planned um, for April 2020, a, a big cleanup plan, which we had to cancel because people didn't understand how COVID worked then. So we instead created this Not In My River campaign, where you go out, you collect some trash, you know, throw it up on Facebook, Instagram, or whatever, and you tag 
whoever the next person is to go out and do it, and it proliferates. And as we've gotten more and more um, comfortable being outdoors together, we're getting more and more trash cleanup events that are happening. Um, so this is just an example from one site where we cleaned almost two tons of trash out of the river at three different sites throughout the Santa Cruz. Here you have me weighing the trash bag so we can get a sense of what the total weight is of the trash that's hauled out, because we typically count by bags or dumpsters full, which is a pretty rough estimate for, for data purposes. So I have an intern that's working with me right now from the University of Arizona. We have some, fund, some funding from our flood control district, and like I said, we're trying to quantify the makeup of the trash. We're going to where the trash is to understand what the trash is. In the future, we're gonna do a more randomized statistical assessment where we're gonna do randomized points where we're gonna try to understand what the overall load of trash is in the Santa Cruz River. So we need to know what's there first, then we can start talking about overall how much is there, which can help work, us, work our way back to uh, what the sources might be and how we can address them. We do tons of outreach, like I said, around dragonflies. So we uh, do Dragonfly Day now every October. This will be our third one um, this year, fourth one this year. We have libraries throughout Pima County. Those living river reports that I was talking about go into a kit, a nature to go kit, that has a little craft thing in there for kids to make dragonflies. It has pamphlets about what different dragonflies are, coloring books, and knowledge for, for the, the readers and the family to understand what's happening in the Santa Cruz. And we invite people to come out to join us to tour the river to see the dragonflies, and we've been doing it virtually as well. The county is doing all sorts of infrastructure improvements. So I've been talking a lot about those trapezoidal channels. Every once in a while, they need to kind of redo their FEMA um, qualifications for making sure that things are safe. Pima County has done that recently, and they have the good governance to say, all right, Pima County, we're going to bust the seams open. What do you want us to jam in there while we're fixing the banks, repairing levees, doing things like that? So they came up with 20 projects. Um, and they contracted with me to come up with an a online dashboard survey where people can say, yes, I think this is a project that should be prioritized. I agree, I partially disagree all the way down. Um, we have 14,000 project reviews and, of the 20 projects, and they were nearly all net favorable. So this is showing that there's an engaged community that appreciates that their elected officials are putting time and money toward making a workable, usable, functional, enjoyable river corridor, all while they're trying to make things safe. So things that were addressed were, let's clean the trash up. Let's make more wildlife corridors, because there's a huge highway that runs parallel to the Santa Cruz River that bobcats and you know, large charismatic megafauna uh, don't fare especially well on. So where can we punch some wildlife corridors underneath? Really usable and useful things like that. Uh, I also run a Santa Cruz River conference. It was just a couple of days ago. So John, I know, and Sarah, I know where you guys are at. Um, uh, this, we do it both in Spanish and in English now. That's a really nice benefit of it being over Zoom is that we have hired language interpreters so we can have a Spanish channel and an English channel, because I think about here we have about 18% of the population in Lubbock is Spanish speaking, and Pima County and Tucson are comparable. They're like 20, 23%. So we want to make sure that um, our residents who are Spanish speaking are able to get the same benefit out of the work that the county is doing um, as the English speaking residents. Similarly, we've started creating our Living River reports in Spanish as well um, for that very same reason. It's, it's, we're connecting, I'm charged with connecting my community with the resources that nourish and sustain them. And if I'm cutting out a part of the community, um, I'm not really fulfilling the mission of what I'm trying to do. So this has really been a nice effort that's gotten us a lot of new perspectives around the work that we're doing and we're engaging with a much larger uh, proportion of our population than we had been before. So I just wanna close, I think, with just a few nice pictures to the left, you have the Nogala stretch of the river. To the right, you have a portion of the Heritage Project um, part of the river up in, uh, by downtown Tucson. So my takeaways, we've all already said this already. Um, but we know that we're the problem. We are the ones who drew the water down. But 
How great is it that we're now a part of the solution? It's really, really <laughs> rewarding. Um, particularly now that there are stretches of the river that are flowing, that weren't flowing when I moved to Tucson in 2018. <coughs> now we have like five more miles of the river that weren't there before. It's killer. Um, and community connections, really, they do matter. So when you're seeking to do any sort of municipal work, find your champion, find your elected official who gets it, who will be able to persuade other city council members. Ideally, just go to the top, and if you can get the mayor on board, go for it, or the governor even better. Um, equip all of your communities with knowledge, and equip elected officials with that very same knowledge. Um, and leverage legal requirements to benefit your bottom line. There are lots of, there are, um, lots of regulations, guidances, policies, ordinances that go neglected that can be used for clever purposes. So uh, if you've got a mind to take a look at that and uh, take advantage of that, it does really work out nicely. My example here is that stretch of the river where we closed the gap where the river had gone dry. That's a good use of, of using legal requirements um, to, benefit the, to benefit the ecosystem. So on behalf of Sonora Institute, which is myself and Claire Zugmeyer, my staffer, we are the Santa Cruz River Program. It's just the two of us. Um, thank you for this invitation. It's really been lovely to be here. You're a lovely group. Um, and if we have time, um, I'll take any questions. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Good prompt. Um, so we recently received, yep. so Green Valley here, this is that dry stretch of the river, historically. There's a big population push heading into Green Valley. The town of Tubac, Tumacockery, Green Valley, Salrita. Um, there's a big population push heading in there and people make wastewater. Um, so we got a Bureau of Reclamation grant to assess the water portfolio for that Green Valley stretch of the river to come up with potential in-stream or floodplain restoration projects in there. Um, so everything right up to implementation, we're going to basically be coming up with a portfolio of projects that we can put in front of the mayor or whoever it is to be like, look, we're ready to go. We just need your OK to do this work. Um, there's also a historic ranch there called Kanoa Ranch. If anybody has seen Oklahoma, like the 1955 Oklahoma, um, Shirley, uh, I forget what Shirley it is. It's not Shirley McLean, Shirley, it'll come to me. Um, at the beginning, she's like in a pool, swimming. That's supposed to be in, like the, in Oklahoma. That's at Kanoa Ranch. So there's a lot of work that's happening in and around Green Valley, a lot of populations moving in there, and they're seeking to increase the amenities down around there, and hopefully more to come. Thanks. Yeah, Jeff? So it, it's really heartening to see that long line of people walking down to, yeah. and then you've got the hashtags, and people, there's just so much community involvement. So how do you, how do you replicate that? I mean, it seems like it feeds on itself. Yeah. But how do you start that? How do you get enthusiasm going? So, yeah, I mean, getting, getting enthusiasm built is tough, especially when you have the headwinds of generations of neglect or malinformation or lack of information. So um, we've, we really use these Living River Reports as the flagship uh, to get the information out there. We distribute them, something I failed to say, in Tucson. Um, we mail them out to 11,000 households. And we do that because we're partnered with Pima County and the city of Tucson, and they prioritize, they, they see the value in these, and they want to make sure as many people can be reached as possible. So that is, that's when we started creating the report in Spanish. Um, and we don't stop at the report. We do research days. We do that consortium. And we do all sorts of outreach all year long. Claire and I are just giving presentations whenever we possibly can. Um, we have a really good marketing team of one uh, who's just got a really good bead on good hashtags, good 
events for us to go to, which ones to avoid. Uh, and it really helps us, it helps two people cover a whole lot of ground uh, and make a lot more of an impact. Yeah. But getting started with a big problem, I think is a really nice, a, a, not nice, but you know, we, we only started doing these living river reports because the river was trashed and something very catastrophic was happening with those trees dying. We got the money to do it and then that, that snowballed. Yeah. All right. Oh, oh, yeah, back. Yeah, just um, uh, in terms of institutionality, I mean, you guys, as you said, there are two of you, right? What happens next uh, when one of you retires? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Who's picking up the flag and running? Yeah, I mean, that's a, we are constantly looking for means to expand. Um, one of our big projects that we're looking at is identifying infrastructure improvements down here in Nogales. Well, first of all, we get very, very little money. Our budget is tight and always in the red. Um, so we're always looking for projects that will help us expand so that we can start bringing more staff on. We have a new CEO as of the last year and a half, and he, we've come up with a five-year plan for each of our projects. So now we have a vision when we're asked, what do we want to do with the Santa Cruz or with the the Colorado River Delta or wherever, we can speak to what, not just, hey, check out what we're doing right now, let's do more of it. Here's what we want to do to make sure the river's flowing more and more. Um, so the big project that I'm looking at right down here is how can we bring more water, more clean water to the residents of Nogales, Sonora, so that that helps to close the loop of more water through all that infrastructure and ultimately into the Santa Cruz River where we can start implementing a lot of riparian restoration. Um, because it's a, I mean, it's a long, it's a long unmaintained leaky system. And we need to find a champion who will help us identify how to close that loop so that we're cutting down on leaks. And all of this I think makes for a really good sell for some big, philanthropic entity to throw some money our way so that we can help expand our program, yeah. Because we've long been a very small program. It keeps me up at night, that's. <laughs> All right, yeah, please. What, what is the cost of water living in Tucson or in that area? I would be, I'm ill-informed to tell you that, I'm not sure. I know that they have recently a tax a dollar per household fee on for some green infrastructure work that the city is looking to do. Okay. Um, and there's currently some real tension between the city and the county because the city is, uh, owns the well fields where the water is being pulled. Um, and a lot of unincorporated Pima County gets water from Tucson. So they've rolled out differential rates this past year, um, which seem to be relatively minor, but it's kicked up some, kicked up some dust in the water community, yeah. But getting that water in from the Colorado River is no small feat. Next time I come back, I'll be able to tell you. Yeah? Um, in the Brazos River Basin, the upper Brazos, uh, the, the streams are very intermittent. I mean, they, they often just dry out and the little pools form. Yep. And they have these uh, fish called the small eye shiner, I believe they're called. They can survive in these, these pools. Yep. And when the, River starts flowing again, and then pick right back up. And they have a, uh, they're competitive. They're, they're predators. These little fish, they can't survive this. So um, the fact that these streams are intermittent is actually a good thing for these shiners. If, if you're creating a, a stream that flows more continuously, um, uh, does that going to have any effect on on these fish that that, that survive because the, their predators can't survive? Uh, yeah, no, I hear you. So uh, a professor at the university has, in his lab, one of his grad students has taken a look at, on that drying stretch, what's dying, because it's, it's diurnal. People shower and flush more often sort of in the morning and at night, so there was, the river was doing this all the time, and they were assessing what was getting, what was getting left behind, and it was more often than not the top now because they're so small and feeble. Um, but I do wonder, 
you know, with these very sensitive and small and apparently delicious fish species that are the native ones, how they seem to be able to continue to proliferate and expand their habitat year after year despite there being bluegill and carp uh, and, and mosquito fish that will predate on, on them. It's, a, it's an interesting question because, like I was saying before, it's a, it used to be a real boom and bust river. And now we have this resilience where the river is almost always flowing for 23 miles and almost always flowing for 16 miles to the south. And we don't have that on-off system that we used to have. Yeah, I don't know if that's been, if anybody's I mean, really looking at I mean, it. It seems like the, the reason why it's flowing more continuously is because you're bringing water from the Colorado River and putting it in there. And, uh, I think they have the same problem here with when they build these reservoirs, the reservoirs have to release water at a certain rate, and it creates a more continuous flow, yep. and, and, and these fish are, are dying out because of that. I'm going to ask around. I'm going to ask about that when I get back. Good, that's a good question. Yeah, thank you. I got a flight to catch. Thank you all. <laughs>